All right, so open your Bibles and turn to Third John, chapter 1. All of us at the back of your Bibles. Third John, chapter 1. going to read a few verses from John's book here. A few verses to start us off this morning. In verse 1, and the Bible says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So here we, we see the Apostle John writing a letter to, um, to, this, to, this, to this Christian, to this, to this brother in Christ named Gaius. Uh, I want you to listen to the words that John is using this morning to describe his love for this particular, um, this particular brother in Christ. He says, the well-beloved Gaius whom I love in the truth. And in verse 4, John goes on to say that I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So John is describing his love for the brethren here. He's, lo- he's describing his love specifically for this man named Gaius, as well as all of his children. When he says his children, he's talking about people that he's led to the Lord and also his um, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, the letter was written by John, okay, it was penned by the Apostle John and sent to this, sent to this um, brother in Christ, Gaius, but it was inspired by God and, and is intended for all believers. Okay, that's why it's in the Bible here. All right, there was, there was lots of letters that the Apostle John would have written in his time, okay? They didn't have emails back then. They didn't have Facebook and digital communication. They simply wrote things. So when he wanted to communicate to people and to other Christians around Jerusalem and Israel and further parts abroad, he would have to send letters that would have got delivered in person by a post person, someone who was tasked with delivering the mail at that time. But this particular letter is here for a reason. Okay, when, whenever we look at the books of the Bible, we have to constantly ask ourselves, why is it here? All right? There was lots of letters that John had written, but yet God chose to include this one. Okay, I'm sure John had written many letters to many brothers in Christ, to many Christians at that time, but God, for one reason or another, decided to include this particular letter in our Bibles. So we have to pay specific attention as to what God is saying through John in this particular letter. Okay, so John had, re- John had penned this letter, but it was inspired by God. God had told John what to write when he was writing to Gaius. And when we read these four verses, we need to substitute John, what he's saying to Gaius, and substitute it, well, what's God saying to us? What's God saying to Christians all around the world? So let's, let's look at those verses again. And it says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, talking to the brethren, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly. Here John is speaking, but I believe God is also speaking when he says, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You know, when when I look at this letter that John wrote, and this letter that God chose to include in this Bible here for us, the one thing I can clearly see is that not only did John love when Christians walked in the truth that the apostles had preached unto them, but God loves when his children walk in truth. God's, God loves when his children are real and walk in his truth. The first century church were warned on several occasions about false people and false things who were not living in God's truth. And I'm just going to quickly go through, we're just going to go through a few different portions of scripture here 
in the New Testament where we can see some of the apostles and some of the writers of the New Testament writing to the Christians, writing to their brothers in Christ, warning them about these false things. Turn very quickly just back a few books to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. And verse 1, we see here from another letter John had wrote. He said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone into the world. So those false prophets are around at this time. John was warning the Christians, John was warning the brethren that there was false prophets around. Okay, and he's, he's, he's writing to them to, to, to give them that to give them that warning, that, that caution, that you need to test the spirit. You need to test what, what's behind the person that might be saying something to you. There's false prophets around here. There's people going around saying things that is contrary to what they've been saying. And he's trying to warn them that there's false prophets around. There was false teachers back in that time as well. John and Paul, and um, right through all of Paul's um, epistles, he too was warning many times about false teachers that had crept in, false teachers that were around teaching things contrary to the gospel which the apostles had been preaching themselves. What about false gospels? Galatians chapter 1. We see one of Paul's warnings here in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And we start there in verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you un into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you that ye have received, let him be accursed. So Paul here was, was, was warning strongly to the church at Galatia that there was false gospels around. There was people teaching and preaching and trying to tell people of things contrary to the gospels that they had preached, contrary to the truth that they were preaching about Jesus Christ and about his resurrection. So Paul here was warning the Christians, warning the brethren, warning his brothers and sisters of Christ that you need to be careful about what you might hear. It might not be truth. There was false worship. There was false worship back in this time. In John chapter 4, if you turn to John chapter 4, let's see what the Apostle John wrote here. John chapter 4, and if you go down to verse 20, John chapter 4, verse 20 says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye you know, you know not what, ye know not what ye worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And Jesus here was saying that God is a spirit, and that because God is a spirit, he needs to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. There's a specific way, there's a right way to worship God. And of course, there's a wrong way to worship God. And, you know, today, back then, there was, there was people... Um, many people, including the Jews themselves, for, for, for hundreds of years that taught it right to worship God in a certain way, in their own way. They thought it was okay to build statutes and build, build idols and worship, worship them. And yet God had specifically said that you're not to worship anything other than me. Okay, not, not to worship any, any false idol, any, 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 um, any other man or any other king. Their worship was supposed to be towards God. But yet, people still persist about worshipping in their own way. So there was false worship. There was, you know, there was false Bibles back in, back in the first century church too. You know, our Bibles don't include 
um, what is known as the Apocrypha, but they were written, some of them were written back around this time as well, and people were handing them out, just like certain um, religious um, organizations might do today, they would hand out their own literature, what they think God is telling them, or what they think the gospel is. This was happening back in this day too. This is why the apostles were pretty strong and pretty um, um, you know, consistent with their warnings towards other Christians that you need to be careful about these false teachers. You need to be careful about these false prophets. You need to be careful about how other people might be telling you how to worship God. You need to be careful about what other people might present to you as truth and scriptures. There was false, there was false scriptures back then. And there was also false brethren. False brethren. Galatians chapter 2, you'd hear Paul talking about this. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And let's look at what Paul has to say here in verse 4. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. So here we have the Apostle Paul himself declaring that there was false brethren. There was false people, okay? In the first century church, the apostles had spent many times warning the Christians about these false things, these false people, these, these um, false prophets, false teachers, false gospels, and even false brethren, people who come in pretending to be something that they were not. And they went around spending a lot of time making sure that Christians knew this, that there was a difference between someone that was truly born again, someone truly following Christ, there was a difference between scriptures that were really inspired by God versus, versus other scriptures, other writings by other men, and um, that there was a right and a wrong way of them worshiping God. But you know, these things that were around at this time in the first century church, these things are still around today. These things still exist today. And in fact, they're more rampant now than they ever were before. All right? You just look at um, the false prophets back in their day. For every one false prophet that was around back in these times, I can guarantee you there's 10 of them now. There's many person on the internet, um, on TV, um, trying to speak for God, speak in God's place, and yet what they're saying doesn't match up with the word that God has given us. There is many false teachers around today trying to teach us something or trying to teach us different doctrines, and again, they don't match up with what God has given us. There's false gospels, you know, ways how people can get to heaven, you know, ways how people can, um, you know, pay for their sins, and if they do this or do that work, like the Catholic Church will often teach us, or, <clears throat> you know, if we, um, if we just, you know, give money to certain churches, then, you know, we're good in God's eyes and we get to heaven too and everything will be good and we'll prosper. These are false gospels. They are contrary to what God preached to the apostles, to what Jesus preached to them directly himself. They're contrary to what is written in God's word for us today. These false teachers, these false um, gospels are still around today. False Bibles, false scriptures, they are definitely more rampant now than ever before. You know, there's a big business spinning out new Bibles every single few weeks. You know, if something was perfect, which is what God said it is, His Word is perfect, He says. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. If His Word is perfect, then why do we need new ones? Why do we need changes and revisions? You see, these are false Bibles. They're not being pushed by God. God has already given us His perfect Word. We don't need another more perfect Word. But yet these false Bibles around today, and we need to be careful of them. And just like back in Paul's time, back in John's time, you know, there's many, there's many um, a person professing the name of Christ. There's many a person calling themselves Christians. Um, but you'd have to wonder, are they doing what God wants them to do? Are they living the way God wants them to live? You know, are they being real with themselves? Or are they false brethren? And when, when we were reading there at the start in 3 John, we see that John was declaring his love for children who walked in truth. He was declaring his love 
for people that were not just um, Christians in word, but Christians in deed. Christians who were actually doing according to what the scriptures were telling them to do, who were living the way God expected them to live, who were behaving and acting in the way that God expected them to do so. You see, John was declaring his love for those Christians, and I believe, as I said, that God is telling us that he also is declaring his love for the same thing. God loves when his children are real. God loves when people are being real with him, when people are being genuine, and that they are walking in his truth, not in someone else's truth, not in something they made up in their own minds or some church might have told them, but in his truth. And this morning I want us to look just at, just at this very thing about genuineness. You know, and I, wanna, I want us to, to ask ourselves the question, how real are we? How real are we this morning? You know, we're going to spend some time in the Bible here and we're going to look at what Paul had to say about this. Um, and we're going we're to see what God has to say about it and see how do we measure up to God's standards of genuineness. So before we get there, um, let's just um, go to God in a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day, Lord, this, for a new day. We thank you, God, that we can gather here this morning as a family, Lord, um, as brothers in Christ. And uh, I pray that you just um, reveal your truth to us now, Lord, that you, um, that you free our hearts and free our minds, Lord, and soften us, Lord, so that we can listen to your truth. And just like Paul was writing here to um, people at this time, Lord, Christians, um, I pray that we would we would also examine ourselves in the same way, Lord, and see, are we being real with you, Lord? Are we being genuine? Um, I pray you just um, bless your word now today, God, and um, just um, clear our hearts, Lord, clear our minds, and free us for your word, God, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you turn to Romans chapter 12, and this is where we're going to stay for the rest of this morning, so all, the, all of the Bible gymnastics are done, we're going to stay in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> We're going to see what God has to say in this chapter. Romans chapter 12, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait in our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy, with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. 
If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt keep coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome evil, but overcome evil with good. Here in Romans chapter 12, we see Paul. Paul is writing to the church. He's writing to the Christians here at Rome. And he's, he's, he's talking about specific things here in Romans chapter 12. Paul is going through a list of things that the brethren should be doing. Okay, he's going through a list of things. So this morning when we look at Romans chapter 12 with what Paul is saying in mind, I want us to ask, us to ask, ask, her, ask ourselves that question. So how can we tell if we're being real and living in God's truth, just like the Apostle John was writing to Gaius about? Firstly, we need to define what a real Christian is. And in Romans chapter 12, Paul is doing that right here. Paul is describing real Christianity. He's, this, he's, he's, he's defining what real Christians should have been doing back in this day and what real Christians should be doing today. He's clearly defining what Christianity, what real Christianity is all about. And he's listing and outlining several attributes that all Christians should have. Now, genuineness okay, is proven by testing for a particular set of attributes. Okay? If you wanted to determine something that's false or something that's real, you would test it for the things that make that thing real. <clears throat> okay? So you've got um, money. Okay? So you've got real money and you've got monopoly money. Okay? You've got fake money, counterfeit money. All right? Every time you hand your money over to someone in a coffee shop, if it's a note of substantial value, like a 50 euro note, you'll often see that person quickly, maybe un unbeknownst to yourself, and you might have noticed, but normally what they're doing is they're quickly checking it. Some of them are putting it under a UV light, or some of them are just simply looking at it. Okay, what are they doing? They're looking and checking that 50 euro note to see if it's real, or if it's funny money. Okay, now, they're just a few small tests, but banks, they've got big tests. Okay, there's trained people that are very knowledgeable with <coughs> currency. Okay, they're not just using UV lights to check for this money. They're actually, they check the weight of that paper. Okay, do you know that currency has a certain weight? All right, every single currency in the world, whether it's euros or dollars, it has a certain weight. That paper has a certain weight. So the bank tellers would feel it and check to see does it feel right? There's a certain type of paper that currency uses. And this paper isn't made readily available to people. So it should be of a certain feel, a certain texture. There's certain characteristics, there's certain attributes that real currency has that counterfeit currency doesn't have. And when they test it, that's what they're looking for. They're, they're checking to see, does this have the attributes of a real currency? And if it doesn't have the attributes of real currency, then the only conclusion that they're left with is that it is not real currency, that it is false, it is fake, it's counterfeit, okay? So in order for something to be proven to be genuine, it has to be tested against what makes it real. And there's plenty of things in the world that also require um, tests to see if things are real. You know, diamonds. You know, there's lots of fake diamonds around. You know, so jewelers and and um, people, in, people in that business, you know, if you were trading them in, if you were trying to get money off them and give them some of your, you know, your really valuable diamonds that you might have thought might have been worth thousands, and then they would look at it under a fine microscope and they would check what's inside that diamond, and then, you know, to your surprise, they tell you, it's a fake. It's not real, okay? You know, your husband might have said that he paid this much for it, but it's, it's fake, all right? It's not real, okay? Because it doesn't have the attributes of a real diamond. It's fake, it's false, it doesn't contain the things that make it real. So you're only left with that it's fake. And it's, it's the exact same thing with Christianity. There, you know, there's probably more religion in the world today than there was back in Paul's day. Okay, back in Paul's day, you had the atheists, you had the people, the pagans that did not believe in God, you had the Jews who kind of believed in God, but they weren't really doing what God wanted them to do, and then you had the Christians who were just supposed to be following Jesus Christ and doing what he wanted, what, he, what, what God wanted them to do. And slowly but surely, more and more, 
religions started popping up, more and more spiritual things and more things trying to be like Christianity, but not quite there. Okay? It had most of the big things. They look, you know, fake diamonds look real. It's not until you put it under the microscope that you find out that they're not. Same thing with um, same thing with money. It, it looks real. Right? Some of these counterfeit monies, they're, they're very good. They've gotten very good at this, but yet it's not real. It's missing some of those key attributes. And it's the same thing with Christianity. It's the same thing with what we hear being called as Christianity today. It might, it might say all the buzzwords, you know, it might use all the words that we expect it to use, but when you really start looking at it and you start examining it with a microscope, you start to see, hold on, there's a few things not right here. It doesn't have all the attributes of what my Bible is saying it should have. So we need to, just like the Christians were being warned back in this day, today we need to be careful as well. We need to make sure that, is it the real thing? Are we being real with God? And that's what Paul was doing here. He was listing a set of attributes so that the Christians at Rome, that they themselves would be able to recognize the false things amongst others and amongst other people coming to them. But not only that, but they could recognize the falseness in their own lives. If they themselves were not matching up to this, then they'd ask themselves some serious questions. Were they being real? Or were they one of the false pretenders that Paul was talking about? So this, this here in Romans chapter 12 is a list of attributes that real Christians should have. And I want us to go through this morning just, you know, there's, there's 12 attributes that, um, that I kind of picked out here that Paul was writing about that, that Paul was saying that real Christians should have. And we're going to look at these and we're going to see just how many of them are present in our own lives. Number one, we see a presentation of yourself for God's use. A presentation of yourself for God's use. We see that in verse 1. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So Paul here is telling the Christians at Rome that they should be presenting their physical bodies, their whole selves, they should be presenting themselves a living sacrifice to God. They should be making themselves available for God's use. Okay, that's the first attribute of a real Christian, according to Paul here. The real Christians should be making themselves available for God to use. Okay? So, if the people here in Rome were reading this, and they were reading this and it's saying that they should be presenting themselves, and not just, you know, their thoughts, but their actual physical selves, they should be presenting themselves to be available for God to use, okay? Then they would ask themselves the question, am I doing that? Am I, am I presenting myself a living sacrifice here to God? And look at the word that Paul uses, which is your reasonable service, All right? He's trying to tell the Christians here that, look, this is the minimum that we should be doing. This is why he lists this out first. This is the, this is the start of the attributes of a real Christian. We sh if, we're not, if we're not doing this, then it doesn't matter about the other ones to come. You have not done step one. You have not presented yourself available. You made yourself available for God to use. It's a reasonable service. Why is it a reasonable service? Why, why is Paul telling him that this is your reasonable service? Well, if you read chapters 1 to 11, it would give you the context of what Paul was talking about here. Paul is talking about the values of, of Christ and how better Christ is over the old Jewish, the old, the old Old Testament, he's 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 presenting to them that Christ is better than everything, and that we were all sinners, that we've all come short to the glory of God, and that all of us deserve to go to hell, but because of God's grace and mercies, He sent Christ to die for us, so that we wouldn't have to go to hell, but we could instead accept His gift of grace, and go and just simply believe in what Jesus did. To save our souls, and so that we can go on, so that we could go to heaven and spend eternity with Him. That's what Paul was writing to. That's what he was talking about in the previous verses, in in, in in the previous chapters, amongst other things. He was trying to teach them and remind them that we were all sinners, but God died for us. God died for you. That's why he's saying here that this is your reasonable service. 
You know, right? If you read chap if you read chapters one to eleven, we see Paul talking about this and saying that Christ has died for you, Christ has shed his blood for you, Christ took the beatings that you should have taken, Christ has taken your place, he was telling the people at Rome. And this is why he then goes on to augment that in the first verse of chapter twelve here with saying, You should present yourselves a living sacrifice because of what Christ did for us, of what Christ did for you. That's why it's our reasonable service. It's only reasonable that we should accept that we present our bodies to Christ so that he can use us for his purpose and his will because he presented his body, a living sacrifice, for our needs. Okay, this is what Paul is talking about. This is what he's trying to tell the people here that this is a reasonable service. This is, this is not unreasonable. This is not something that we should be going, oh, God, you're expecting too much of me here. God, you're asking too much. Isn't that what we find ourselves doing sometimes? Do you, ever, do you ever find yourself doing that? You know, God, you're asking me too much. You're getting me to do too much things, getting up on Sunday mornings, every Sunday morning. I could be in bed, right? You know, that's what I used to do before I was born again. I used to sleep on Sunday mornings. Sunday morning's my hibernation day. How dare you take that away from me, God? You know, isn't that what we find ourselves thinking? That, you know, you know why are you asking to do this, God? This is too difficult. This is too hard. You know, can you not get someone else to do it? This is the exact same things that were going through the minds of the, of the Christians in Rome here. They were human just like us. They were sinners just like us. They had the same feelings and thoughts as us. And this is why Paul was writing to them. This is why God was inspired Paul at this time to write this exact message to them at this moment of time. Because they needed to hear it. And so do we. We also need to remind ourselves that presenting ourselves and making ourselves available for God's use it's a reasonable service, all right? This should not be considered unreasonable. Right? When, you, when you, just like he was getting the Christians at Rome here to go through and remind themselves in, in chapters 1 to 11 about what Christ had did for them and why they were sinners and that they could not justify themselves with their own works, but they needed Christ to die for them. Just like Paul was trying to remind them at that time about this, we need to remind ourselves as well that Christ died for us. And if we constantly bring that into our remembrance, constantly bring that into our memory that, you know, Christ did he, something that we can't measure. It's unmeasurable. Okay, what he did for us is something that we cannot measure out. And if we, if we keep that in our minds, and then we contrast that with what God is asking us to do, all of a sudden, it becomes very reasonable. Okay, there's nothing God's asking us to do that is unreasonable. All right, because what he did for us, it, 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 it beats anything that he's going to ask for us. Okay? He's never going to ask for us to go up on a cross and die for someone else. Okay? He's never going to ask us to sacrifice our loved ones for the world. He already did that. Okay? So when we keep that in our minds, just like he was trying to get the, 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 the Christians at Rome here, is you know, when, you, when you remember what Christ did for you, then the topic of presenting yourselves a living sacrifice to God becomes a lot more easier to do, okay? Because it takes our selfishness out of the way a little bit, you know? God did something amazing for us, and he's just asking us a small thing in return. Just be faithful and do what I'm telling you. All right, it might seem difficult, and it is at times, but when you contrast it to what God did for us, it's not that unreasonable. It's pretty reasonable, okay? so. The first attribute is that we need to present ourselves for God's use. That's what Paul was telling the Christians here, that you need to present yourselves a living sacrifice, just like he did. We need to present ourselves for God's use. Secondly, there's a transformation of our mind. Look there in verse 2, what Paul says in verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you can see here, Paul is going on, he's continuing on, that not only did, did the Christians have to present their bodies a living sacrifice, but also there should be a, a transformation of their very mind, of the very way they think, their thought patterns. Now, before I was saved, I used to think a certain way. I used to think on things in a certain light. I used to view things in the world in a certain way. And when I was born again, I had to 
change that way of thinking. All right? I had to renew my mind, okay? Because my mind was tainted by the world's way of thinking, okay? By the way the world wants us to think about things. The world will have us believe that, you know, abortion is perfectly normal. The world will make us believe that killing babies is just fine. This is the message that you will hear on the radios and the TV and the newspapers and people you talk to. Why? Because that's their thinking. That's the way they think. And they think it's perfectly okay. But when we go to God's word, we see something completely different. So then we have to transform our mind, don't we? We need to change our way of thinking away from what the world thinks, away from what we used to think was right, and just simply change it towards what God thinks is right. The way God wants us to think. That's why he's given us. That's why he's given us his thoughts. He's given us a small portion of his thoughts in his book right here, all right, in, in, in his word, so that we can know how he thinks about things. And if he thinks about things in a certain way, that's the way we're supposed to think about that same thing as well. All right, and that's what, he was, that's what Paul was trying to get the Christians here to understand, is that we, we can't go through the Christian life and think the same way we used to think. Okay, that's how confusion happens. That's how Christians never grow. Because they keep thinking the way they used to think before. And they still try to go through every situation with the way they used to think it. They used to try and come up with solutions to problems based on their old way of thinking. And then they wonder why their solutions never work because they're going on their own thinking and not on God's thinking. They're using their own mind as opposed to the mind that God wants to give us. All right? we, need to, we need to put on the mind of Christ, the Bible says. We need to, we need to renew, change okay, our mind. You know, to renew means to make new. All right? So it has to be different. It can't be the same as it was before. It has to be different. It's supposed to be renewed, transformed. And if we never change our mind, then how will we ever be transformed? Because that's what Paul is talking about here, saying that we are transformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the reason we need to be transformed and change our mind is so that we can prove, so that we can test, confirm, validate what is the perfect, good and acceptable of God. Okay, so we need to have a transformed mind. You know, and there's, there's, there's many Christians today, for one reason or another, they're trying to go through life but they've not done this. They've not changed their mind. They're still thinking the old way. And then they're, they're, they're at odds against themselves because God's word is, is saying one thing and the Christians in their church are saying one thing, but yet then the world is saying something else and their friends and their family are saying something else and they're constantly battling and trying to figure out well, which is right. Well, there's no need to figure out which one is right. God's one's right. We just need to go on what he said. See, straight away your thinking should be, there's no debate here. Okay, there's no negotiating or trying to figure out which one's right. It's God's right. And it doesn't matter about anything else. God's right. It doesn't matter if you can't understand it. God's right. All right? And the sooner we get ourselves into that kind of thinking, the sooner we can get rid of some of the problems in our lives. Because right? most of the problems are done through our own thinking. If we just stuck to what God viewed on the situation and what God thought about the situation, the problem ceases to exist. All right? It's amazing. When we just view things like God views them, all of a sudden, what we seem to be a problem is no longer a problem at all. Okay, the problem was actually going against what God had to say about it. So when we just change our minds to go with what God has to say about it, all of a sudden, the problems go away. And we're actually starting to go down um, the road that God wants to go down. So you can see there, Paul gave a second attribute, and that was that our mind, our very minds need to be changed, they need to be transformed. Let's look here in verse 3 and we'll see um, the third attribute that Paul had written about. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. So we can see here the third attribute that Paul is writing about is the humiliation of our status the humiliation of our status, a humbling. Paul is saying that we ought not to think higher than, than we ought to think. All right? We should not be elevating ourselves higher than we should be. Okay? We should be abasing ourselves, not lifting ourselves up. Okay? 
And that's a common theme right throughout the start of the Bible is that, you know, Noah found grace in God's eyes, not because of any great things he was doing, but simply because he was humble and he was placing himself lower than God. Whereas everyone else at the time around in Noah's time were trying to place themselves higher than God. Okay? We need to be humble. That's what Paul is trying to tell him here is we need to be humble. And that humbling, you know, that needs to come from within ourselves. All right? We need to be the ones that initiate that humbling. Or else God will bring something into our lives that will do the humbling for us. Okay? Those times in Moses' life where God humbled him. Okay? And those times in David's life when God humbled him. Okay? And there's many, many um, repetitions of that same pattern within the Bible where people needed to be humbled by God. Now, all those patterns and all those examples are there for our learning. You know, the boy God tells us that all scripture is profitable for, 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 for doctrine, for proof, and for our learning. So it's there for a reason. You know, one of the things that I try to teach the Sunday school kids all the time is whenever you read something in the Bible, always ask yourselves, why is it there for? It's there for, it's there for a reason, right? It's not there just for reading purposes. It's there to change us. It's there to show us something that we need to do or something that we need to stop doing. And one of the things that we certainly need to do is we constantly need to humble ourselves. We need to put ourselves lower than what we probably do most of the time is we try to raise ourselves up. You know, isn't that what we isn't that what people do when we go talk to them on the doors? I'm not that bad. Isn't that the answer, Brother Eric, that you get a lot of the time? I'm not that bad. Right? What are you what are they doing? It's the exact same that we do all the time. They're lifting themselves up. I'm not that bad. Oh, that's bad, but I'm not I'm not as low as that. All right. Johnny next door is way worse than me. All right, isn't that what they do? Isn't that what we do? We we constantly feel like we need to lift ourselves up towards God. You know, there was someone else that did that first, and it's, I, I believe that's where we get it from. That's what Lucifer did. Lucifer wanted to lift himself up. Okay, he wanted to lift himself up. because He wanted to sit in God's throne. Instead of doing what everyone else was doing around God and going, that's God's place. Our place is down here. We're all level down here. We're all at the same lower level than God. But somehow we still try to find ways to one-up each other all the time. Okay? When, you, when you're working in the office environment, the corporate environment, that's pretty much the every daily routine. People trying to get one-up on each other. Better than that person. I'm going to be better than that person. I might be as good here, but at least I'm better than that person. That's all I hear all day long in offices. How good I am. You know, profiles is what they call it in the corporate world developing profiles for ourselves. So that this is the profile that I'm trying to build so that other people then look at me, they see the profile, you know? Whereas God's profile is very different. It's like, you're down here. That's God's profile. You're sinners, all right? God's profile is, is already made up in his mind. You know, God says our righteousness is as filthy rags to him, all right? We're down, we're, we're supposed to be down here. God is supposed to be up here. That's just the way it is, all right? God is, has, has his place. And everyone else is supposed to be below that. We're not supposed to try and elevate ourselves up. And back in, back in this day here when Paul was writing, there was people within the church, even within the church, trying to lift themselves up. Because it's just something that I think we've, you know, it's, it's a part of that old nature, right? It's a part of that old nature that we got from our father, the devil. It's, the, it's that old nature that we had that we're tr constantly trying to be better than, than what we are. We're trying to think of ourselves more highly than what we should be. And God is trying to teach us that, no, you need to be humble. You don't need to think highly than yourself. You just think the way that I want you to think. Okay? So we need to humble ourselves. We cannot be trying to constantly lift ourselves up to a status that is rightly deserved for God. Okay? That status is, is there for God. That's God's place. We need to be below that. We need to humble ourselves. And it would be better for us to humble ourselves than for God to do the humbling. Okay? So we need to humble ourselves. Let's look here at the next attribute that Paul writes about. We pick up there in verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, 
So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teach it on teaching, or he that exhort it on exhortation. He that give it, let him do it with simplicity. He that rule it with diligence. He that showed mercy with cheerfulness. So Paul is writing about a few other things here. And we see that Paul is describing um, the body of Christ. He's describing the church. He's describing the body of Christ. And he's saying that for as we have many members in one body, but not all those members have the same office. Okay, and these, in, in this passage of scripture here, Paul is, is making the analogy that the body of Christ, the church, is like a body, right? There's different members, okay? There's, there's many members that make up the human body, okay? You've got your hands, your toes, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, you know? You've got eyes, ears, not to mention everything else that's internal. There's lots of things that um, work together in harmony, all unique, all there doing its own thing, serving its own purpose, but yet, if any one of those things wasn't fulfilling its purpose, then the human body would fail to work, okay? That's why people get sick. Certain parts of the body stop working, okay? For one reason or another, whether it's environmental factors, you know, everything causes cancer these days, bad diets, bad, you know, food, you know, bad um, uh, environmental controls in offices, you name it, there's a lot of external factors that come in that kind of bring down the body, okay? Not to mention the fact sin also destroys our bodies. So when we're playing with things that we shouldn't be, you know, smoking, drinking, um, watching things with our eyes, all these things will have a, a negative effect on the body, okay? And it will cause certain parts of the body to cease to work. And then the body will no longer be able to function. It's the same thing with the church. It's, it, Paul is describing it as a body of Christ. So we can see the attribute that Paul is talking about here is that real Christians, okay, if you wanted to test someone to see if they're real, according to Paul here, real Christians should be doing their part in the body of Christ. You can see here he's talking about that there's many members in one body, but the members have not the same office or the same role or the same function, purpose. Okay, so there's different purposes. They've got different gifts. God has given each and every single one of us different gifts, okay? Some people are better teachers, okay? This is not because they've studied for years upon years in a college. It's because God has given them a gift to enable them to be good teachers, okay? There are some people that are better um, um, soul winners. You know, the Bible says, he who winneth souls is wise, all right? Not everyone, all right, this, this, is, this is a fact, okay? Not every single Christian in the world is going to lead somebody to Christ. That is a fact, okay? And it's because some people, God has actually planned, God has planned for that person to be a soul winner. God has planned for that person not to spend their time paying the pulpit, but to actually be out going door to door and bringing those people in, okay? God has given them a gift. God has given some of us gifts to be more compassionate towards others. God has given some people a gift to exhortate and, and to build up other people in the church. That's their function, that's their purpose, right? If everyone in the church was just preaching, then, you know, there'd be no one listening, right? If, 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 if everyone was out, if everyone was out soul winning every day, then there'd be no one sitting in the chairs, all right? You know what I mean? There's different um, functions, there's different purposes, but each office is important. Each role is important. You know, your, your small um, toes on your feet, they might seem pretty insignificant, okay? Your baby toe might seem pretty insignificant part of your body. But if you ask any amputee, someone that's lost them because of frostbite or whatever, when they've lost that toe, their whole balance is thrown off and they have to learn how to rebalance themselves minus that digit, okay? All of a sudden, now that small digit starts to have a lot more significance, you see? God placed it there for a reason. Now, it was very different from the eye, okay? It was very different from your ears. It was very different from 
your tongue was very different from your lungs, but it doesn't make it any less important. Okay? Each and every member, every part of the human body is important for the body to function as a whole. And it's the same thing with the church. God has given different gifts to enable different people to do different things. God has picked people according with these gifts to do certain things. And if everyone did their thing, if everyone fulfilled their purpose, their role, their office, then how great would that church be running? Okay? And I'm not just talking about this local church, I'm talking about the church, all right? The body of Christ, believers in Christ. You know, we are not the only <laughs> believers in Christ here, you know. There, is a, there should be a whole world of believers there that make up the body of Christ. And if every single one of us was doing the office, the role, the purpose that God had for our lives, imagine how different the world would be, okay? You know, it's like, it's like the world and Satan is pushing forward in its march towards conquering God. Okay, that's what they're trying. And it's the Christian's job, it's the church's job to push back. All right, it's the, it's, it's, it's the church's job to fight the good fight, as Paul says. It's, 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 it's the church's job to keep slowing those people down. You know, we're supposed to stand in the way of people running to hell, not showing them the path. Okay, we're supposed to get in their way. We're supposed to be an obstacle to them. We're supposed to, we're, we're supposed to make it difficult. The church is supposed to be doing certain things because God told us to do it. God gave the Great Commission to the apostles to go preach and teach. He had a certain plan for them. He enabled them with gifts. But nevertheless, they had to go. They had to do it. They had to fulfill that role for their life. Okay, Paul, he was given a task. God had enabled him and equipped him to do certain things. If Paul had neglected that role, we wouldn't have these, we wouldn't, we, well, we wouldn't have Romans chapter 12. <coughs> wouldn't be here. Paul did not do it. Okay, so we can see that, you know, there's, there's things that we need to do as the body of Christ. And if we, you know, we need to do them. All right? I can't tell each and every one of you what is your role in the body of Christ. That's between you and God. God has given you gifts, and over time you should know what those gifts are. All right? Maybe you're a good teacher. All right? You'll find out pretty quickly if you're a good teacher or not. Okay, um, you know, you find out if you're compassionate or not. All right, I wouldn't be the strongest when it comes to compassion. Okay, I wouldn't be the one that you'd probably be running to for consoling if you're in the depths of despair. I'd probably kind of just point you to the black and white and go, "It's your own fault." You know, you should have done things right. But there's there's other people in this church who are very good at that, and they're they're that way for a reason. God made them that way. God made me a different way. I'm not the compassionate one. Okay, I'm the, you know, it's, 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 like, it's like in Jude, you know, you've got two people, um, one, one saving by the fire, you know, one, and one, one is the more compassionate one. Okay, so I'm the other, okay? But there is compassionate people here. I will try to help you, but that's not my forte. Um, but everybody here has a part, an office, a role to fulfill in the body of Christ. And here's the thing, most of the time, I find myself all the time thinking this way, and I don't know if we are the same, but a lot of the time, Christians always expect something to be done by someone else. Even though that's the office that probably God had made you responsible for. All right? You're supposed to be the pinky. All right? You're supposed to be the eye. You're supposed to be the mouth. If you're not going to do it, then who else is going to do it? You know, maybe, maybe God planned that for you. You should be doing that. All right? We should be doing that. We have our own part. So real Christians, real Christianity, people need to be doing their part. All right? We don't need to do all the parts. Here's the thing. We do not need to do every single thing that God instructed the church to do. All right? Because if we try to do all of that, we're going to burn out. We're not going to be able to do it. And if we're burnt out, we'll be useless. And God won't be able to use us for anything. That's why God gave many. You know, God said he gave some apostles, <coughs> some pastors, some teachers. All right? The reason he gave some, more than one, is so that the work could be shared. All right? Many hands make light work. All right, so that's what Paul is trying to teach them here, is that, look, you get, you gotta, you got to do your part. And he's talking specifically to the church in Rome here. If, if each one of you don't do your own unique parts, this church in Rome is going to collapse. And in the more broader sense, if the church, if, if, if Christ's church, each one of us doesn't do our part, then we're going to affect the, um, the, um, the potential for that 
for the, for, for the body of Christ to affect this world, all right? I honestly and truly believe that if every single Christian did their part, we're not going to stop God's plan from happening, right? This world is going to burn away, but you never know. God's grace just might linger just a little bit longer, all right? A few more souls might just get saved if we did our part, okay? So we need to do our part in the body of Christ. Fifth attribute, we see here in verse 9, Look what Paul says in verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor preferring one another. So we can see here the fifth attribute is we need to be loving the right things. We need to be loving the right things. You know, this month we're talking about love. right? This whole year we're talking about love. And this month we're talking about what not to love, love not the world. Isn't that the start of the memory verse for this month? Right, love not the world. So God is clearly trying to teach us that there's some things that we shouldn't be loving. And there's some things that we should be loving. Okay? Now love is one of those things, it isn't just a feeling, but it's actually, it, love is an action. Love is something that we do. It's not something we feel, it's something we do. Right? We give ourselves over to something and that's us giving that thing our love. Okay, so if we were to love the world, we would give ourselves to the world. We would actually go to verse 1 and we present ourselves a living sacrifice to the world's use. Right? We would make ourselves available for the world's bidding. Right? You know, um, every time, um, you know, every time back in my younger days um, when, I was, when I was drinking or whatever, that's what I was doing. I was giving my body for the world's use. Okay? I was giving um, my love to something else. All right? I was loving this. Or I was loving computers and gaming and um, loving going to the pub or you know, loving hanging around with the wrong people, loving watching the wrong things. When I should have been giving that love to God. Okay? So there, there's clearly a need for us to love the right things. Okay? You know, love needs to be real. Okay? He says here in, in verse 9, let love be without dissimulation or pretending, fakeness, falseness. And you know, again, in the office, the office spaces, you'll always find everyone smiles at you. You know, lots of smiles. They're fake. Right? A lot of times, they're not really, they don't really, when they ask you how your day is, they don't really care how your day is. They're just trying to make themselves nice. Okay? If they're being honest, they'd probably just like grunt and walk past you. You know, because not everyone is that happy on a Monday morning. But love has to be real. And when we're giving our love to God, it needs to be real. That's what it's saying. Let your love be without dissimulation. Let your love be without falseness. So when we say that we love God, okay, Jesus Christ himself said, if you love me, keep my commandments. All right, so if you love me, do what I'm telling you. All right? Don't say you love me and then do the opposite of what I'm telling you. All right? Don't say you love me and do half of what I'm telling you. All right? He says, keep my commandments. Do them, okay? Love one another. Be kindly affectionate one to another. That was actually one of Jesus' commandments to the church is that we should be kind to one another. We should have a brotherly love to one another. So we, there's certain things that we should be loving. We need to love the right things. There's a whole list of wrong things that we shouldn't be loving. And there's a small list of things that we should be loving. God, Jesus, the church, Christian brothers. That's about it. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Everything else, it's of the world, he says. So we just need to love his word, we need to love God, we need to love God's people. Everything else doesn't matter, right? If we love those three things, we'll do what God wants us to do, and everything should be work out better in our lives. Not that we won't have problems, but it'll be a lot better than if we're loving the world. So there's things that we should be loving and things that we shouldn't be loving. We need to love the right things, according to Paul here. The seventh attribute um, is in verse 12. Look what it says. It says, um, uh, or sorry, um, the sixth attribute in verse 11. It says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So the sixth attribute that a real Christian should have is a burning passion for serving God. See what it says there, not slothful, that means lazy. Hey, don't be lazy, you know, like a sloth. Anyone know what a sloth was? Sloth, you know, anyone see Ice Age? You know, Sid the sloth. Basically he was lazy, right? So slothful, sloths were really, really slow creatures. They were kind of really slow. Um, they were lazy. You know, so if someone's lazy, you know, in your household, you call them a sloth. 
all right? You know, it's a good word. There were certain, definitely some lazy people around when I was working. Um, they were slots, you know, but it says not slothful in business. What business? Not the world's business, but God's business, okay? The business of God, the church. We shouldn't be lazy in this business. We should be fervent in spirit. Fervent means to be on fire, to be burning, okay? It means to be hot. So we need to be on fire. Our very spirit for God needs to be on fire. And, we need, and, and why, do we, why do we not need to be lazy? And why do we need to be fervent in our spirit? So that we can serve God. Okay, so we need to have a burning passion for serving God. If there's Christians around the world who don't have a desire to do what God wants them to do and serve God, then are they real? Right? You know, if, if we're sitting down, if we, if we constantly wake up every morning and we find that we don't care about what God cares about and we don't care about what God has asked us to do and we don't care about souls and we don't care about people, we don't care about God's word, we don't care about the truth, if we don't care about these things, then clearly our spirit isn't on fervent heat for God. We're being slothful, we're being lazy, and we're not serving him. Okay? And yet he clearly commands us that we should be serving him. And the only way we're really going to serve him is by not being lazy and having a fervent spirit for him. We need, we need to have our spirit on fire. Is our spirit going to be on fire every single day? Probably not. But it's our responsibility to try and reignite that fire all the time. Okay, that's why the Bible talks about revival. Okay, and we've seen it throughout the generations where the church would dip. And then all it took was one or two people to get that fervency back and God would send revival. Right, those up and down trends in the church history. You know, I believe right now that we're in that kind of downward trend. I think the church is pretty lazy today. I think we're unfervent. We are not burning. All right, we're like a coal lump of coal, but all it takes is that lump of coal to be pushed near the fire again and it'll start to ignite that fire. And I think if each of us, again going back to doing our part, if we did our part and if even just one of us had that fervent heat, it would spread like wildfire and the church would be on fire for God. So you can see that this is an attribute of being a real Christian. If we're not on fire for God, then we're not being genuine. This is one of the things God checks for. You know, are you hot? You know, remember what he says in Revelation, are you hot or are you cold? But you're probably just in the middle, lukewarm. No one likes that, really, do they? God certainly doesn't. He wants you to be on fire. So we need to have a burning passion for serving God. Look at the seventh attribute that Paul talks about here in verse 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. You know, we need to be joyfully patient in times of trouble. That's what Paul is saying here. Paul is, Paul is saying to the people that, look, we need to rejoice in hope. We need to be patient in tribulation or trouble. And we need to, we need to be continuing instant in prayer. So, trouble come, troubles come and go. All right? God never said he's going to take the troubles away from our lives. There's not one part in the Bible, at least I've not found it yet, that God says that he will make your life easy and he will make your life to be protected against all of the pain and the trife and the troubles of the world. In fact, my Bible says the opposite. He says, if you're, in, if you're in me, if you're in Christ, you're probably going to suffer persecution. You're probably going to have troubles. And in fact, as the latter days come closer and closer, those troubles are going to multiply more and more. All right? And we see that already. All right? There was a time, probably 20 or 30 years ago, where you could go tell someone that abortion was wrong. And nobody would have batted an eyelid. They would agree. Oh, not now. Now you're the one that's in the wrong. You're just an old religious zealot, a bigot, you know? And um, it's like, okay, um, it's what God says, not my, not my opinion. You know, at the end of the day, my opinion doesn't matter. It's what God says. You know, it's the same with, you know, sin. Sinners, oh, that's just religious hocus pocus. That's what you get from people, you know? Oh, that's just old fairy tales or old stories. Well, you're, you're free to believe that, you know? But it's still true. You're still going to be judged at the end of the day, so maybe you might want to re rethink your, your mind. Troubles, they're going to come. You know, if you're a Christian, if you're breathing, they're going to be troubles. You're going to have health problems. You know, we'll all have health problems at some stage. Um, if we don't already currently have some, we will have some. It's not, an, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. You know, health will deteriorate like everything else in this world deteriorates. Um, money comes and go. You'll have financial problems. You'll have problems within your family. 
you try telling them that they're a sinner and that Christ died for them, trust me, you'll get some problems every now and again. Um, you know, troubles are going to come. You'll have troubles in the workplace. You'll have troubles in um, your friends and in the world, wherever you are. There's going to be troubles. But God, God is telling us here, through Paul, that we're supposed to be patient in these troubles. And we're supposed to be joyfully patient. All right? you know, so even though we're going some, through bad times and through some tough times, God is still trying to tell us that it's all right. I'm with you in the valley. You just need to be patient and be joyful. You know, and joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? Joy, peace, love, happiness. You know, we're supposed to have joy. It's another, it's another sure sign of someone's Christianity. You have your joy. You know, if you, if you remember what Christ did for you, you should be joyful. You know, Christ died to save you. That joy should be there. And it should be very, very difficult for someone to take that joy away from you. You know I mean? If you're constantly getting your eyes on Jesus and seeing him on the cross in your place, you should have joy. And we should be joyfully, okay, we should be joyfully patient in times of trouble. Wait for God's solution instead of our own. The eighth attribute that Paul lists out here is in verse 13. It says, distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Paul is saying that we, that, that real Christians, need to have a willingness to give what we have to others. All right, we need to be willing to give what we have to others. Okay? Um, a lot, the world is focused on getting. All right? Everyone goes to work so they get something. Okay? And all everyone cares about is money and possession, materialism. You know, they judge their worth by what they have. They judge, they judge their worth by what they own. Okay? And yet God is saying the exact opposite. God is saying it's better to give than to receive. All right? That we should be cheerful givers. We need to be willing to give what we have to others, distributing to necessity of the saints. If there's a brother and sister in Christ that needs something, we should give it to them. Money, give it to them. You know, um, food, give it to them. Whatever, whatever they need, we should be giving to them. That's what, that's what the Christians back in this day were doing with Paul. When Paul was going around, he was making tents to make some money for himself, but there was always times when he needed a little bit more. The churches then would kind of pool their stuff together, what little they had, and they give it to him. Why? Because that's what God told them to do. Give the necessity of the saints. Isn't that what we're doing today with missions? Right? When we give our money, what we're doing is we're pooling all of our money together so that we can give to the saints that are in need of that. Right? Some of, some of these missionaries um, living over in Asian countries and, and China and these places, they've got some real needs. Financial as well as as well as everything else, you know, we can we can provide their spiritual needs by praying, but you know we 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 give physically to help meet their physical needs. Okay, so we give we give our of our money, we give of our time, we give of our prayers, all these things. We need to give, we need to distribute to the saints, and we need to be given hospitality. You know, it should not be a part of the Christian that we are not willing to help someone out. That we are not willing to open our door up, to open our house up to someone in need. Okay, um, this is what Paul is talking about here. We need to be willing to give up what we have to others. You might not have anything to give other than your time, so give that. All right? Again, God is not being specific about what we need to give here. He's not saying give money or give this or give that. He's saying just give what you have. All right? Remember the remember the lady with the with the um, the mite. All she had was you know all she had was one, you know, one thing, that was her whole possession, but she gave it, okay? And God put that in the Bible for our learning. What little we have, if we only have two pennies to rub together, give the two pennies. You know, God says that he will, he will bless us for it, he will reward us somehow. We just need to be patient, right? But we need to be willing to give what we have to others. That's a sure sign of a real Christian, that we need to give what we have to others. Look at the ninth attribute here in verse 14. In verse 14, Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Paul here is saying that we need to be blessing those that hurt us. That's a difficult one. Okay, blessing those that hurt us. All right, especially when the people that are hurting us aren't even Christians, you know, and we're supposed to bless them too. Yeah, we are, you know. Um, <laughs> bless the Christians that hurt us too. There'll be people in this church at some point that might hurt each other. You're human, it happens. Right, and you know, if you're breathing and you've got a, you know, a brain up here, you probably think different ways to someone else. Chances are there'll be conflict sometimes. 
especially when you get your mind away from Christ and you start thinking your own way. Problems, okay? There's going to be problems. People are going to hurt you, either intentionally or unintentionally. Either way, you're going to get hurt at some point, and we're supposed to bless those that hurt us. You know, if we go around trying to constantly uh, hurt people back or, you know, avenge them and um, get our own back for how we've been hurt, if we're constantly focused on our hurt and our problems, you know, what if God did that? What if God focused his efforts on how we hurt him? Hmm? What if God had focused his efforts on how the world had hurted him and said, I'm not going to send my son to die in your place because you've hurt me. Right? You've hurt me. You've, you've sinned against me over and over again, even though I've given you tons and tons of chances. I'm just going to burn you up. Right? God could have done that, right? but he didn't because he had grace, he had mercy. And even though people kept hurting him, and God does get hurt when, he, when we sin against him, he decided to instead be merciful and to give grace, to pour his grace out on top of people. Okay, We're supposed to be like him. All right? that, that, that's what God's plan for us is, is to be more like Christ. We're supposed to be made, we're supposed to be, in verse, in verse um, 2 there it says to be, con- be not conformed to this world. You know, we're supposed to conform to Jesus. Tony was talking about that a few weeks ago. We're supposed to be conformed to Jesus. We're supposed to be made like him. Okay, So we need to be willing, just like God, to bless those that hurt him. We need to be willing to bless people that hurt us. Okay, you know, If you're doing that, you're definitely on the right road to, to being the Christian that God wants you to be. And it's a difficult one, but it's something nonetheless that we have to do. We have to be willing to humble ourselves, put our pride away, and forget to hurt as well, and just bless them. Okay, we need to bless those that hurt us. Look at the tenth attribute here in verse 15. Verse 15, it says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. We need to be available, we need to, we need to be available to help others. Okay? We need to be, you know, when people have birthdays, when people have weddings and all that kind of stuff in the church, or whatever, we need to be there to celebrate with them. Okay, that's what it's saying. Rejoice with them that rejoice. You know, celebrate a good time, right? You know, whether it's someone graduating college or someone um, getting married or whatever, you know, the church family should be getting together and celebrate with those people. We should be joining, we should be rejoicing, we should be um, rejoicing that someone in the church got a good job or got a new house, whatever. We shouldn't be covetousness, you know, we shouldn't be envious of their new car or their new flashy toy or whatever. We should be rejoicing of their success, okay? We should be rejoicing that God is blessing them because they're doing their bit for God, right? Likewise, when those that are weeping, we should be weeping with them. People will suffer loss. People will, you know, um, suffer loss in their families or go through bad times, difficult times, financial troubles, whatever, you name it. We should be making ourselves available to help those as well, to be there to weep with those that weep, okay? We shouldn't be so self-absorbed that we're not making ourselves available to help others, okay? So we need to help others in the church. We need to make ourselves available to people. Look at the 11th attribute here that that Paul is talking about in verse 16. Verse 16, it says, Be of the same mind, one one toward another. Mind not high things, but condense said to men of of low estate, Be not wise in your own conceits. The 11th attribute here that Paul is talking about, it's saying, Treating everyone as your equal. Okay, treating everyone as your equal. Be of the same mind one toward another, and mind not hide things, but condescend or lower yourself, dive down, lower yourself to a low estate, and be not wise in your own conceits. So we need to treat others as equal. You know, God treats everyone as equal. He's not a respecter of persons. You're all sinners, and Christ died for all of us. Okay? And we need to be the same thing. We cannot be looking at people in any way, especially in, in this church, we should not be looking at people with ourselves being higher than them, or someone being lower than us. Okay, and this goes back to what um, he was talking about in verse 3, about our humbling. We should all be humbled. And if everyone humbles themselves, guess where you'll be? All at the same level. Right? If you all just humble yourself, if every single one of us, including me, humble ourselves, we'd all be at the same level, at the foot of the cross, below God. Okay, so we need to treat everyone as our equal. We shouldn't be looking down at anyone, and we shouldn't be looking up at everyone. If you're looking up at someone, what are you doing? You're elevating them up into the place that God should be. The only person that we should be looking up at is God. It's Jesus. 
everyone else should be horizontal, right? We shouldn't be looking down at them, and we shouldn't be looking up at them. It's equal. We're all the same. We're all sinners. We're all in help. We're all in need of God's grace, and we're still in need of God's grace. We're all the same. And lastly, look at the twelfth attribute here that Paul was talking about. In verse 17, it says, Recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire in his head. Be not overcome evil, but overcome evil with good. So the last attribute that Paul is talking about here is that we're supposed to be, Christians are supposed to be doing good and dealing honestly and living peaceably with others, okay? As much as light in us, all right? You know, there might be just some people in the world that we might find it very hard to live peaceably with. But still, as much as in you to live peaceably with that person, then that's what you should be doing. It, do as much as you can do. All right? not, you might not be in a position to spend every waking hour of every day with every single person. You might just not get on with them that well. But as much as is in you, he's saying, that's what we need to do. All right? we, we, sh we should be going out of our way to be good to these people, to be good with others, to be honest, to treat them honestly, and to live peaceably with them. You know, there might be, you know, we, we might only be able to do so much. But whatever that is, whatever that level is, then that's what we should be aiming to do. All right? Um, we shouldn't be doing the opposite. We shouldn't be going out of our way to not live peace with these people. We shouldn't be fighting with people, all right? Would it be a sad state of affairs if, if you had an estate, a housing estate, and the one house that was causing all the ruckus in that estate was the Christian house, right? Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be a total contradiction to what God is asking us to do here? We should be living peacefully with all of them. They can be fighting with each other, but we shouldn't be fighting with them. All right, that's what, he's trying to, that's what he's trying to teach us here, is we Christians should be willing to do good to them, even though they might hurt us. Again, this is going back to the last one, blessing those that hurt us, all right? Blessing those that hurt you. We should be dealing honestly and living peaceably with others. So we can see here in Romans chapter 12, 12 attributes. 12 attributes, 12 characteristics of a real Christian, according to Paul. 12 things that all Christians should have in their life as marks of that um, genuineness, you know, to show, to show that we're being authentic. So, how did you do on Paul's test? All right, how did we do when we looked at this? When I was looking at this, there was a few there, I was like, I don't know, I don't, think I've, I don't think I've met that one yet. I don't think I've, I don't even think I've understood that that was required of me. Okay, I haven't even thought about it. But you know, this, this, is, God's, this is God's test of how real are we, are, how real are we with him? You know, are we, are we the real deal? Are we the real Christian? Or are we just being fake? Are we being the fall? Are we are being false like, um, like the rest of the world? Are we actually doing what God wants us to do? Are we being, are we being real? You know, when you examine yourself, and Paul often talked about examining ourselves, are these attributes or even some of these attributes present in your life? Now, I think some of them should be. Okay, some of them definitely should be. One and one and two <laughs> definitely should be. Okay, if you haven't done that you know, we need to get working on them. We need to present ourselves a living sacrifice for God and we need to transform our mind. But all your attributes, they need to be there. All right, they need to be there. You know, and if you'd fail this test and none of these attributes are present, then perhaps you were never born again. You know, if you'd never present yourself a living sacrifice to God and if you never changed your mind and you didn't, you didn't do any of these things, then maybe, did Christ really die for you? You know, because if he, if he died for you and you knew he died for you and you're looking at Christ and he died for you, trust me, these will happen, all right? Naturally, your love for Christ and what he did for you will, occur, will make these occur in your life. Not all at one time, but they will happen. If none of them have happened, I'd be asking myself questions. Am I born again? Have I, has Christ really died for me and have I put my faith and trust in him? You know, it would be better for us to test our genuineness here on earth before God does it up in heaven. And you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna read 1 Corinthians chapter three, but you know, Paul actually says, um, you know, to be careful of how you build on the foundation which they had laid, which, which the apostles had laid at that time, which was Christ Jesus. 
And of course, everyone had the same foundation, right? If you're born again, the foundation is Jesus Christ. But he's saying, be careful of how you build upon that. You know, what materials are you using to build your Christian life on? You know, are you using things like gold, silver, or are you using things like wood and hay? Because he says, you know, they'll all be judged by fire, you know, and God will judge them up in heaven. God will judge our lives and he'll see what it is, what did we do with our Christian lives? And did we do the right things, like Romans chapter 12, and invest in gold and silver and build on, build on Jesus Christ with the right materials? Or do we put up some wood, hay, and stubble, which is going to burn away? You know, in, in, that same, in that same passage of Scripture, Paul says that, you know, God will actually reward us for being genuine. You know, if, if, you, if, we, if we did the right things according to Romans chapter 12, and we built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ with gold and silver and the things that God wants us to do in our lives, that we'll get a reward for that. They will, they will stay. They will not burn up. Whereas... If we were to do the wrong things in our life and not do what God wants us to do and start going by our own thoughts and building on the foundation of Jesus Christ with wood, hay, and stubble, they're going to burn up. They won't remain in heaven. All right? That's what, that, that's what God is trying to teach us there. So, you know, we need to be genuine. There needs to be some real Christians. You know, the world needs real Christians. Okay? It doesn't need fake pretenders. It doesn't need the false religions that are out there. It needs genuine Christians need people that are actually living wholeheartedly for God and doing what God wants them to do. So, you know, how real are you? You know, that's the question that we should be asked. That's the question I've been asking myself. It's the question we should all be asking ourselves. How real, how real are we? How real are we? God, we thank you now, Father, for just this opportunity to hear your word, Lord. And I, I pray, God, that um that you would just uh, use this now, Lord, to teach us just, um, you know, what it is that we need to do for you, Lord. You've given us your word. Your word. You've given us clear um, guidelines, and you know we have the instruction manual, Lord. But sometimes we just don't seem to follow it that well. God, I pray that you help us to follow it better. That you help us to be more like you, to um, be more like Christ, God. And Lord, if there's anyone that's not born again in this room, Lord. Someone, if there's someone here when they look at themselves and they look at their lives and, you know, if they were honest with themselves, they're not living for you, Lord. Um, they've never trusted in you. They've never accepted that they're a sinner and acknowledged that you died in their place, Lord God. And today is the day of salvation. You know, they need to get right with you today. You know, don't, you know if, there is, if there is anyone here like that, you know, they don't need to be um, afraid or, um, you know, nervous, whatever, they can just come talk to anyone here. Just, just find someone, Lord. You know, work their hearts. And find someone so that they can go talk to and get right with you today, Lord. Um, God, bless the rest of the day. Bless the preaching of your word tonight. Bring us back together here safely. And we praise you now and give you the glory for all things. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>